lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike Podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah. I had a frustrating day. Yeah. So. <laughs> I gathered yeah. for our, from our conversation before we turned on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> been a long one. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know. Having to adjust to new things in, in the office. Like we yeah. we changed our accounting software, and that's what I do. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and um, well. so there's like a whole bunch of things about it because we decided to do this now, but... The idea is, well, we want to start with the new year and the new system. Yeah. But it's February. Well, which means uh, that for, everything that I did us, in January. This is the new physical year. New physical year started. Fiscal. Physical. Fiscal. Fiscal. <laughs> it's the new fiscal year. Our mm-hmm. our physical year started Saturday. Okay. So well, that's not ours started January one. <laughs> so y'all started on the new year? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh it's February now, which means everything I did in January I have to do again. Oh. I, like I have to re-enter it in, into yeah. the new system, and just setting up the new system sucked. And you know, you, you use a system for jeez, uh, fifteen years. I was gonna say it's got to be fifteen <laughs> years, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, roughly. Because when I first started at that company, I didn't do all the the uh, stuff books. you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. but I, I started doing that in two thousand eight. Yeah. Um. So thirteen years. Yeah. Um, that I did time. this or 14 years. Anyway, um, you know, you get used to doing things in a certain way and then suddenly like everything kind of looks the same, <laughs> but it doesn't. This is the reason like, I hate don't, updating you, my phone, by the way, yeah. because it's every time you update stuff, like it's kind of the same, but it's different and yeah. it looks kind of different and well, it functions yeah. a little different and it's irritating. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you, you end up with weird things too. Like, you get used to inputting particular types of data and you're like, you know how many times you have to, have to hit tab to get to the next field that you need to enter something in, right? Yeah. And now that number is different. <laughs> yeah. And so like I, I tab three times and I'm in not the right field and oh, and man. I'm used to being like, I'm used to like type a thing, tab three times, type a thing, tab twice, type a thing, tab twice, type a thing, tab, tab, you know. Yeah, like, you've got a rhythm. Yeah. yeah. And now the, the number of tabs is different. Like there's new fields yeah. or they don't, they've rearranged the fields or, <laughs> you know, yeah. just like, oh, yeah, yeah. it was just, I, I had to back up and do something again. I, I cursed many, many times today <laughs> at the one, office. And, one of uh, days. Yeah. And then um, we had a client that came back or why well, I say came back. Um, we just haven't gotten any work from them in a while. Like they weren't ever like not officially not working with us or anything. They just didn't have any overflow. Yeah. Right. But, um, So they're, uh, they've given us some work and, um, I need to be able to log into their system so I can upload billing stuff and what have you. Hmm. And, uh, but it's been like more than a year since I logged into their system. So I go in and it says, uh, your password has expired. You need to reset. Okay, cool. But then it wouldn't let me reset my password and it wouldn't (laughs) let me log in with the old password. And, uh, you're just I'm locked just, out. Yeah, so I can't. And I, I was, yeah, so I left. I was like, I'm through with all of this today. I'm just done. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't want to do anymore. I'm, uh, I'm going to break something if I stay here any longer. So. Been there and done that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we should start off with a, uh, with a correction. All right. Um, I don't remember where exactly we said that the Nord Stream 2 was running when we were talking about it in the last podcast, but we were wrong. Um, I, th- I think we said it went south of Ukraine cause I thought it was running through the, the black sea, but it runs through the Baltic sea, oh. which is North, gotcha. not South. <laughs> um, so it's like, up, you know, by the Scandinavian countries down through, yeah. through there, not through. All I knew was that Slavic it ran countries. through a body of water. Yeah. Like that's all I knew. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's Baltic, not black. So, okay. um, but it doesn't really change the the discussion that much. But yeah. uh, it, you know, just it is a different yeah yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I did want to talk about that a little bit more because the the more I th- the more I think about this conflict with Russia and and so forth. All right, let's just start by reminding everyone that every time we have complained about Russia, that the U.S. government has complained about Russia and 
in the last several years. Yeah. Um, they have said that the response should be to shut down the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Like the, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline has become a discussion of what can be attacked every time we have complained about Russia since this project started. Yeah. <laughs> essentially in 2018. Yeah. Um, and I've started to think more and more uh, as I was looking into this, and I didn't get as much time to look into this as I wanted. I, I even took a day and a half off work, but that doesn't really happen at my office. Like I took a day and a half off work, and then I ended up working like a full day on my half day and like a half day on my full day off. And Man. anyway, um, so yeah. Oh well. Um, but the I, I, I'm beginning to think more and more that this is all about selling natural gas to your like. U.S. companies selling natural gas to Europe. I yeah. think that we're, um, you know, threatening military intervention essentially so that we can guarantee profits for or revenues US for companies. U.S. energy companies. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I know it comes up constantly. Like when you listen, like for years now, like that's mm -hmm. always been the thing is like, you know, we're, we're do away with the Nord Stream, like blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and... I, I don't know. The whole thing, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there's a whole bunch of pipelines that run through Ukraine yeah. from Russia to, to uh, Eastern Europe. Yeah. Um, and they call it the Ukraine Corridor. And yeah. Ukraine government actually makes a significant amount of money off of this gas transport through their country. Yeah. Um, they also use some of it, uh, although they have developed their own um, natural gas uh, supplies over the last several years um partly i think because they you know with their um antagonism towards russia they can't rely on russia also for energy at the same time <laughs> yeah um although uh, roughly half of uh ukraine's energy comes from um nuclear plants really which yeah I, that was news to me too i found that interesting hmm. um so good for them on that <laughs> yeah but yeah. um anyway um i i I have really started to think that this is really what it's about because you had a, a significant portion of Europe's gas that was coming from Russia running through Ukraine before the coup in 2014. And it was after that coup that the discussion of the Nord Stream 2 came up. And part of the reason for that is so that Russia didn't have to run stuff through Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so they could double the, the volume of gas that they were providing to Europe through the Nord Stream pipeline by adding the second line. Um, and they didn't need to rely on all these pipelines running through Ukraine. Um, they also have the, uh, the Turkish line, um, that runs, uh, through the South. That one actually does run through the Black Sea partially. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I think that in the end, a lot of this is, uh, so, and also Russia provides like roughly a third to a half, depending on the source of the natural gas to Europe. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, like a third to a half of Europe's natural gas comes from Russia. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. That was stated better the second time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the U S has always wanted to sell liquid natural gas to Europe. And I, I think that I, I'm starting to think more and more that like this whole thing, the Ukrainian coup, um, the, uh, all these attempts to block the Nord Stream 2, um, it, like that this whole thing, all these things are connected and it's all about securing, um, energy supplies for Europe through the U S instead of through Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't have other people we can sell this stuff to. Like, I mean, I, I know that that's a big market and whatever, but, um, I think we like them better than most anybody else that we could sell this stuff to. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. We can get better prices from them than anybody else we can sell this stuff. And that's yeah. part of the problem, too, actually, is because Russia's gas is cheap. Yeah. Um, they, they sell it cheap, but we got to, you know, compress it down to liquid natural gas and then ship it across an ocean. Yeah. I mean, it just seems like, yeah, the whole having to ship it across the ocean would be kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah. And you have to keep it under pressure the whole way. Yeah. All right. So. Um, I'd be so, worried about pirates coming and taking it. 
Not so much. Not so much anymore. <laughs> yeah. Hard to well, I mean, you can worry about pirates, but them stealing the natural gas. Is, <laughs> the old thing, that's the that's not the ship they're going after. No, probably not. Yeah. Um, they'd be better off just like taking the watches off of the crew <laughs> than, than trying to transport. <laughs> trying to, yeah. Unless they took the whole ship, but you're not getting away with that. Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. Um. In order to for the U.S. to be a good seller to Europe, the prices have to be higher. And as long as Russia is supplying such a large amount of natural gas, the prices are going to be low. It drives low. the price down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there is some complaints about that how Russia is withholding uh, natural gas. Like that, you know, there's this threat that's per, at least a perceived threat um, about if there's any kind of conflict, Russia just turn off the energy using it as leverage. Which, I mean, you know, I, I'm not saying that they would never do this, but they're also talking that they're kind of doing it right now, and that doesn't seem to be the case. They're providing their what they have contracted. Yeah. Um, and what, I guess, you know, one of the things that you might run into is that there is a limited amount of production yeah. on these things. So if you're selling... Okay, so if you have something that you produce yourself... Yeah. And you produce more of it than you need, so you sell off the excess to somebody else. Yeah. And you say, I will provide you X amount. Yeah. I, I contractually will provide you X amount. Um, and then it, it turns out that they want more, yeah. and you have a surplus, so you continue to sell them more than what you contracted to sell them. Yeah. Because you've got it. Yeah. And you don't need it. Yeah. Do you keep selling that much to them when you do need it? <laughs> well, obviously not. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you yeah. provide what you contracted. Yeah. And, and then, then you keep what you need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you may even run into a problem where you start providing less than you contracted if you need more. But that's yeah. another issue entirely. That's certainly not what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, and Russia says that they have a higher need. Yeah. Um, and so they're using what they need to use and they're providing what they have obligated themselves to provide. Yeah. Well. Yeah. There you go. Um, and and the other thing that I was thinking about earlier is that, like, I think Europe has kind of victimized itself with its own green energy plan. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because they're, you know, they have they have limited production of of dirtier fossil fuels. We'll yeah. say dirtier. Yeah. I mean, natural gas is a pretty clean burning fuel, so yeah. um, it's still a fossil fuel, but it's... But it's cleaner than yeah. coal. Coal, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, but the, I think through limiting... this, Europe is running into an energy crunch. Yeah. But they're running into an energy crunch because they have limited the production of their own energy supplies by trying to remain green. And yeah. they've actually shut down a whole bunch of green energy supplies in the nuclear plants as well. Yeah. And so now they're needing more and more energy, but they're producing less and less. And so they're more and more reliant on Russia for energy. Yeah. Which puts them in a predicament. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it could, yeah. but it's their own fault. Yeah. <laughs> well, they got to They got to meet those, um, requirements man from the paris agreement like, yeah that's well, the, <laughs> they've, that. done, they've done obligated their self man they can't go back on that that's true and there's uh, <laughs> some people will track them down or something if they don't right yeah yeah because no, there's no, this all. big there's, binding thing yeah right? there's no enforcement mechanism here they could definitely <laughs> renege like we have yeah and, and actually we we haven't uh, we withdrew we, from the agreement, but we're still meeting all the requirements as I understand it. So, oh, yeah. Well, I thought yeah. Biden signed us back into that. Well, he might have. Who knows? I don't know. Like, it's not binding, so it's not like it matters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. King Joe. Yeah. Um, after the dawn, after King Barry. King Barry. King Barry. Barack Obama. Oh, okay. King Barry. Yeah, okay. And and he was a follow up to King George. So you know. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. got the whole royal family going here. <laughs> I mean, and it, actually, we can shift into something else from that. From that point, is that we have been um, investing more and more power in the executive, yeah. and there, it, the the division of powers was intentional. <laughs> well, in, yeah. In the Constitution. Um, and of course I, like I can go into the, uh, the foreign policy part and, and, and speaking of actually, be, I guess before we move on, I mean, I, I kind of did already from the, um, 
Ukraine issues to the pipelines to the green energy. I'm kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just stay with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, these things are all connected, I I think, but um I did want to point out um you know, while the US is still saber rattling and and talking about the imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine and and saying that, you know, uh Nord Stream 2 will never come online if Russia invades Ukraine and all these things that are yeah. that are being said. Um the Russia, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and France all came together and uh, de-escalated and met and signed a ceasefire. Yeah. They, the, like those four countries, ag- all agreed. came together yeah. and um, agreed on a ceasefire for Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, uh, just the other day. Nice. So good news. Yeah, it is good news. Except that the U.S. doesn't isn't paying any attention to that <laughs> whatsoever. N- yeah. None at all. I was gonna say I hadn't really heard about that. So <laughs> I'm not saying it ain't been on mainstream media, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, I will tell you what I did see the other day. So there was um I think they were Ukrainians, but I don't actually they look like Russians to me. <laughs> were um on one of the stations and they were just talking. I guess um some group of them had joined the military to defend Ukraine and whatnot. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Let me, let me back up a little bit. Yeah. When you say they look like Russians to you, that means that they were white. <laughs> well, they were, but they, they had a Russian accent. Oh, like okay. They were, I mean, they sounded like Russians. And when I say they look like Russians, what I mean, I'm actually going to what I mean okay. is like, Russians are pretty tough dudes. <laughs> like, okay. I'm just, do we really want to fight a war with Russia? Uh, I just, I looking at those guys talking the other day on the news, I was like, dude, like that was my first thought. <laughs> okay. That do was my look, first thought. Do like, they look tough enough to survive a thermonuclear explosion? Because that's well, the only thing. I mean, that that's really what really matters. matters. But even if you believe in the fact that we can fight a conventional war with them, yeah. do you want to? <laughs> like, I'm just saying, like, you look at those guys versus like your standard Americans. I just don't know, man. Like, <laughs> American military, though, is different. They're, well, they're the toughest of the tough. I'll give them that as yeah. far as our guys go for yeah. Americans. I'm yeah, just, I mean, it's not like they're going to be fighting against the fat Netflix watching well, couch surfer. Like, I mean, it depends on how far you think it goes. Well, I, I mean, but your point's taken that it won't go that far because it'll end up going nuclear and then there we are. Yeah. But like, I mean, if we were in like a draft situation, you know, I mean, some of these fat guys have, on the couches are maybe end up over there. <laughs> if we were in a draft situation, we would definitely have a lot to talk about on this podcast. Well, no doubt there. Before we get there, let's talk about the draft sometime. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, uh, just the thought I had, I was just like, you know, Russians are pretty tough dudes, man. I'm just saying. I don't yeah, pick um, a fight with the biggest guy on campus. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, and well, no, this is a rabbit hole. I don't want to go. That's fine. (laughs) Um, But uh, in terms of the investing a lot of power in the executive um, recently, like, so uh, I don't, we never really talked about the Supreme court decision about the mandates. Did we we? didn't, we, um, that was when we had our little lapse. (sighs) Oh, okay. Um, Well, all right. There's not a whole lot to say about it at this point, but um, I would say that the arguments kind of, uh, from what I read and saw about it, um, the arguments kind of... Uh, Missed the point? Well, yeah, but, <laughs> but rested on who has the authority to do these things. Oh, yeah, right? okay. Like, that it was it was about, well, you know, the, the president, the executive can't order these things. The legislature is the one that legislates and makes laws and rules and so forth, not the executive. And, that, like, that was a big part of the Did it ever come up at all that the federal government they, doesn't have this power at all? Well, yeah, <laughs> I remember uh, Sonia Sotomayor said that she didn't understand why the states would have have the power but the federal government wouldn't right? <laughs> yeah exactly part of the argument. yeah um but uh yeah i mean the the question of whether any government should have that authority i don't think really came up yeah um and that's certainly a problem with the decision they yeah. you know it, it was it it came down to procedural stuff about who gets to make the rules not about whether the rules themselves were constitutional Should be made yeah. yeah yeah um and uh and that's certainly a problem with it and then they kind of split hairs a little bit with um that they said that the mandates were illegal for the private businesses but they kept the mandates in place for um healthcare workers in facilities that take medicare and well yeah. no just medicare just, right like I it think wasn't it was medicare, just medicaid medicare. Yeah. but um 
But like almost every healthcare facility takes Medicare. And this, this actually permits the government to do this kind of soft authoritarianism that it does all the time, yeah. um, which is we're going to give you a whole bunch of money as long as you do what we want you to do. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's your money that they're giving to these people, <laughs> right? by the way. Like, well, and you know. couldn't you even potentially even go as far as to, well, if we're going to give you a tax break, mm-hmm. then you have to follow what we say, too. Oh, sure. I like, mean, it, it's, it the could same, work, it's two it sides could work. of the same coin. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm getting at, though. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, I mean, and that would that could apply to tons of different businesses. Yeah. Um, I just, I when I saw the decision, I was like, that's, I mean, they, they just got it wrong, man. Yeah. Like, I agree. I think that they were talking about the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. The um, argument was over the wrong thing. And uh, and in the end, while I'm happy with the decision that they can't enforce these mandates on private businesses, I'm unhappy with the decision about healthcare workers, and both of them rested on the wrong arguments. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. Well, uh, I was relieved because that the one for private businesses affected me personally. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad that I was... Um, that that one shaked out the way it did, but mm-hmm. um, but it was still the wrong decision. Like, yeah, well, it was the right decision. It was the wrong reason. Wrong reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah but then with the healthcare workers, like, I mean, there's the wrong sh- decision and the wrong reason. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. no, and and they're trapped, and it's unfortunate. Um, no. You know, the fight's not over. I mean, no. I, I think I, I think the whole issue is essentially over. I was talking to a doctor yesterday. And um, talking about, uh, you know, whether to do boosters, whether to have kids vaccinated, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and his position was uh, no. And when asked why, he's like, well, they don't work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. seriously. Like, <laughs> that doesn't really get much more complicated than that, does yeah. it? Like, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no sense in doing it if it doesn't work. I mean, yeah. um, so you know, hopefully we're, we're really kind of at the end of this thing. You you know, uh, John C. Dvorak on the no agenda show talks all the time about how he overlaid, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, my vocabulary gets worse and worse (laughs) as I get older. Like I know there's a specific word and it was like in my head for just a second and and I lost it. And now I can't even find a good replacement. (laughs) I ain't good. (laughs) I know. Um, and I, I had, you know, I, I might be a little dehydrated today, but anyway, um, the trajectory, there you go. That's ah, actually the it. word. Yeah. <laughs> um, overlaid the trajectory of the Spanish flu with this, uh, pandemic yeah. such as it was, um, and has said that it should be over around April. Yeah. And I think that we're and It on seems pace. like, yeah, we're, yeah. we're on track. For I mean, exactly. I think we're ahead of that pace, but I think that it'll truly be over by then. Like, I don't think yeah. the media can prop it up past then. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that. Yeah, I certainly hope that that's, yeah. I certainly hope that that's true. Um, but as long as we're talking about the Supreme Court, um, I think that we should probably talk about Biden's pronouncement and he made it before he was even elected. I was going to say, yeah. He, um, I mean, this, he can't. That was something he said on the campaign trail. Yeah, that that uh, he will, if he's given the opportunity to put somebody on the Supreme Court, um, he will choose a black woman because they deserve representation. Yeah. Now, um, and there's like a, there's so many things that I want to say about it. I mean, the most obvious thing is, doesn't that by itself? Um, contradict the uh, the rules about government discriminating based on race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And gender. I like yeah. if you are only considering a specific race and a specific gender, isn't that discrimination? discriminatory? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, and I, I think that he's faced some backlash about this, although he's not he's not going to back down. Um, well, no, and and that while he has faced some, because I've seen some some backlash to it, but. I've seen way more praise than I have backlash. Yeah. And um, that, that doesn't surprise me. No. Because for some reason, this is more important to people than having the best person on the job. And it may be that the best person is a black woman. Yeah. But to preclude everything else. Yeah. To only look in one direction, just to see, the highest court in the land, like the most yeah. important, you know, judicial body in the country. Yeah. <laughs> seems short sighted. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and it, I don't know. It just feels forced when you, when you just, even when he said that on the campaign trail, Mm -hmm. like it, it feels like just such a blatant pandering. Yeah. Well, the other part of it that I keep thinking about is like just the statement that they deserve, that black women deserve representation on the court. And it, this, I think inherently racist assumption that (laughs) it, that there's a community that has a particular worldview because of their, their race and uh, gender being black woman. Yeah. And particularly like when you start really examining it and you start thinking about whether a federal judge, most likely not in all cases, but a, a, yeah. most likely a federal judge was probably an Ivy league education and a high level of schooling and wealth and influence is representative of black women across this country. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because yeah, you make a good point there because that's not representative at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> I um, mean. And I, I'm, I have a hard time imagining that anybody that he could pick would be a good representative for the average black woman in this country. Yeah. No more than any of those guys, the white guys are oh, yeah. representative <laughs> exactly. of me. Like yeah. I would never claim that they represent me in any way, no, shape no. or fashion. Like, I, I mean, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, I actually even like Gorsuch most of the time. Yeah. Um, it, it, although, you know, in, in most decisions, actually, it seems to me that Clarence Thomas does the best job of representing me. Yeah. And is the black man on the court. Well, there you go. Like, and I'm not black for the, yeah. those of you who don't know me, which is just about everybody out there. Yeah. Um, so, but here's the other thing. Like, if you're talking about representation, if you want things to be representative, mm. I guess. Um, I mean, look at the makeup of the court. Uh, you already have, uh, so you, you have one Hispanic woman, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, yeah. um, you have a black man, Clarence Thomas. Yeah. Um, there's nine members of the Supreme court. Yeah. That means that you have 11% Hispanic, um, and 11% black. Yeah. Well, that's roughly their population in this country. Um, uh, Latinos and blacks are 12 to 13% of the population of the U S. Yeah. Okay. So they have a representative proportion of their ethnicity, yeah. presumably, <laughs> already. Um, so there's four women. Uh, it's a little less than it should be. But this is one that can swing either way. It's like 51% women in the U.S. or something like that. It's like just over 50%. Yeah. Um, so they're just under 50% of the court. Yeah. Eh, you know, close enough. Yeah. And they're about to get a new woman on the court. So then they'll be 55% of the court. And, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, there's no way to split it perfectly even anyway. Right. Like, yeah. Um, exactly. Now, so <laughs> to me, it seems like if you wanted to try and represent the various ethnicities and so forth in this country, isn't it time that Asian women get a representative on the Supreme court because there are no <laughs> Asians on the Supreme court. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and they represent six and a half percent roughly of the uh, U S population. Yeah. So if you, if you add another black person, then you have 22% of the court representing 12% of the population and you have 0% of the court representing six and a half percent of the population. That doesn't seem fair to me. The, the problem is, is that don't sound good in the campaign speech. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to appoint the first Asian woman to the U S Supreme court. <laughs> Yeah. And down with China. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. I guess, yeah. You, nope, you have some mixed messaging that, going that, on there. Doesn't work, man. <laughs> yeah. Not the same. <laughs> and I, I I think that there's some problem with just like generalizing Asian. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's I, it's I a know. little, I think this is yeah. one of those things in flux. You know, it was like 30 years ago, anybody that was vaguely Asian could be called Chinese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's certainly not true anymore. Yeah. And I think you have to be more specific. So Asian is itself racist. You have to, you know, it has to be Japanese or Korean or Vietnamese mm-hmm. or Chinese or Laotian or I have whatever. To, I have to know exactly what they are. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And if you can't tell them apart, then you're also a racist. Oh man, I'm in trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it can be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. <laughs> you just gotta, you gotta go to a good school where you meet a whole lot of Asians. Then you can start being start able to tell being them able to tell them apart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ex- exactly. Um, mm. So I bet you could identify Vietnamese. We got a good Vietnamese population here, and we do in uh, Mobile. We do actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, this yeah, this is another rabbit hole. <laughs> but I I just thought like the whole thing is so hypocritical and silly. Yeah. Um, that I 
did just, want to kind of do a little bit of satire about this. To, well, it's insulting, as I think it is, like to to say that you're just gonna absolutely. It, it's so blatantly pandering that it's mm. insulting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah. that's how I see it. No, what I'm you're not. really doing is you're making blacks, uh, and I guess specifically black women, a political tool. Yeah, yeah. Um, like it, overtly. It, yeah. Well, uh, very, very openly. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and uh, and it's a it's a weird one to choose anyway because they like black women overwhelmingly vote Democrat already. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know that you really need to pander. Like, if you're <laughs> yeah. just talking about, like, political influence, you know, yeah. or, you know, votes. If you're just talking about vote, I don't know. Anyway. Well, I don't know. I'd have to look, but I'm sure he said that during the primary. He, yeah. Yeah, that would have been a primary thing. So yeah. he was trying to, to win the party at the time, so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You, you're actually talking about putting a black woman on the court so that you can get white women to vote for you. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I mean, no, really, that's yeah. that's what it is. You're trying yeah. to, to convince the liberal white women that you're woke and non-racist enough and yeah. egalitarian enough that yeah. um, that they should vote for you yeah. over, you know, somebody who is a minority woman. Yeah, right. As an example. Yeah. <laughs> um, I but so unlikable that she could never win an election. Well, I, you had Tulsi, though. She's well, a minority did. woman as well. Yeah, and actually, she spoke out pretty hard. I wish I had the quote. Um, if I looked, I could probably find out. Maybe I'll throw it up on the page mm -hmm. because um, she spoke out pretty harshly against this. Yeah. Um, so bravo to her. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, a anybody who's who really thinks about it has got to it seems to me, come to the conclusion that it's absurd. Yeah, but it's, it's. I mean, I, I give credit where it's due, man, because a lot of people are just too afraid to That's do true. it. Um, well, yeah, are too afraid to say it out loud. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. They may think it, but they won't They won't say it. Yeah, so, I can never run for office again because of this podcast. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Except that I don't try and hide any of this stuff. I know that I'm not yeah. a racist, and so... Yeah. You know, I but I, I certainly have no problems yeah. backing up my statements. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, having the conversation. Yeah. Um I don't know. Is there anything else that you want to say about that? No, I mean I'm I'm pretty well good on that one. I thought it okay. was absurd, so Yeah. Um all right. So last but certainly not least, and uh probably the most encouraging bit of news in our in our podcast tonight, um, is the, uh, the protests, the trucker protests in Canada. Oh man. Um, that may honk, honk. migrate south actually. <laughs> like there yeah. is talk about, you know, a convoy from, uh, you know, from the West to the East in this country too. And well, I hope it happens. Truckers have a lot of power, man. Like, yeah, I mean, absolutely. well, and for one, they're in short supply anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, we're, there's already uh, not enough truckers in this country to begin with. And you start talking about even the percentage of them just parking. Yeah. You got problems because we already have problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's certainly true. Um, I, uh, I saw that they were estimating there was something like 1.4 million participants in Canada wow. in this, in these protests. Um, and I, I suspect, I don't know. I like, I guess I don't really have any reason to believe this, except that I think that the media is very biased against these kinds of oh, issues, absolutely. but I, I suspect that that is a, a, um, an undercount. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it uh, almost certainly is. And especially if you're getting those numbers from the media, mm -hmm. because they, um, I saw a bunch of headlines when all of that first started up where they were, um, like portraying it as something else, like that they were striking over, oh, what was it? They were striking over driver conditions or something. Oh, really? I <laughs> yeah. never saw that. Yeah, I saw a couple of headlines that that's what the headline was. And it was like, man, that's not what it is. <laughs> like, it's they're very open about why they're there, you know. Um, and I saw some interviews of some truckers where they were talking, and a lot of them were vaxxed. And they were like, look, you know, I, I chose to get this vaccine, but I don't think it should be forced on anybody. And so I'm here in solidarity with my other truckers, you know, that have chose not to, that have taken another path, you know. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing that a lot in the <clears throat> medical field, too, where a lot of the people that are protesting have gotten the vaccine. They just understand that mandating it isn't right. Yeah. Well, um, if there are 1.4 million participants and the, I, I was just, I was just Running checking some to be, numbers. Yeah, I was checking to be sure because I, I, I just 
didn't know for certain, but the population of Canada yeah. is only 38 million. Oh, wow. So that means like 5% of the population is involved in these protests. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I've heard that they're the biggest protests in like world history. I've heard that. Um, I, I think it's funny that Trudeau came down with COVID just all of a sudden, yeah. like very conveniently, he can't like be out in front of people all of a sudden. Yeah. Well, uh, the first reports were, were that they moved to, that he fled yeah. essentially uh, yeah. Ottawa. Why? Um, moved to a safe location. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think they do anything to I him. I don't think so. Either. But but I do think that it was smart for him to not be there. Well, I and mean, that's probably true. Uh, he he's not doing any better somewhere else, though. I mean, you've heard some of the things that he's been saying, right? Oh, yeah. Like uh, he. Um, well, <laughs> now the the ironic one um, is the, uh, the like in his first statement when after he fled Ottawa, when they came to Ottawa and his first statement was, we will not be intimidated by these people. I thought that was fun. Yeah, um, right. But, uh, you know, he's, he's gone on to, um, you know, call them a bunch of racists and said that they were, uh, you know, they're, that we can't have this small minority of people, which it clearly isn't, clearly isn't you yeah. know, a, 5% of the total population of your country is not a small minority involved in a protest. Cause yeah. those are the people that actually like because it was if it worth was it a, to them to come out. Yeah. And do if it, it was a small minority, we wouldn't be talking about it. Well, yeah, that's true <laughs> too. Um, and, uh, so he said, you know, the small minority that have, um, like unacceptable views. Yeah. Now just think about the leader of a nation talking about, people's opinions as being unacceptable views, like in a, in what's supposed to be a free nation. I was going to say a free nation. Yeah, you exactly. Know. Um, I mean, I would hope that if, but Bi well, Biden said th some things that were pretty close actually, I suppose, but when it comes to this, the politicians don't have, uh, they, they're, they're very open about censoring the population mm -hmm. when it comes to COVID stuff. Like there's there's no room for disagreement there. Yeah. If if you're not if you're not part of the program, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yeah. I mean that's well, yeah, the attitude. The, this black and white thinking that I won't say that it started with George W. Bush, but it became really prominent in national politics with him. With the if you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. Yep. Stuff. Uh, yeah, um, you're right. I had forgotten about that, but that was his mantra. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, Trudeau, Trudeau's gone on to say, you know, these people have unacceptable views and they're a bunch of racists and they steal, uh, food from homeless people. And like, I mean, yeah. it, it's kind of incredible. Well, some of the things that he's saying about yeah. these people and, um, he, well, it's just absurd. Like. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's absurd, but it's the, the way he's talking about his own population is I think that they should, I think that it's a good thing he's not in Ottawa. Yeah. I mean, like, I would hope that if that kind of thing was going on in this country, that, yeah. that there would be a really strong reaction, we'll just say. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, and there may still be uh, it, when it comes ballot box time. Well, yeah. I mean, I, hopefully yeah. he's ended his career. God, I yeah. that, but I, I was hoping that last election and it didn't work out yeah. that way. So um, I, I don't know how that man has survived. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. he got elected in the first place and I sure don't know how he stayed in office. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he was talking about, you know, through the, their actions, they're threatening small business owners and so forth. Like most trucking is small business owners, is yeah. it not? I mean, a, a large majority of it. Now there are trucking companies. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. I know that there's some so, big ones, but yeah. I, like you don't see like the roadway out there like you used to when no, I was younger. No. I mean, you got like I mean, a SD or whatever. Uh, we, um, I mean, there's SDs. Werner. Um, um, I'm trying to think. There's a yeah. I, there, uh, there's a few that I deal with regularly. Warner's the biggest one, probably. Yeah. But most most truckers are independently employed, but, right? And in fact, um, more and more here recently, the company I work for has had independent truckers delivering our stuff because mm -hmm. um, Warner and the other one we use um, haven't been able to do it. Yeah. And so we've had more and more independent truckers coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, he's. He's talking about a bunch of small business owners threatening 
small yeah. business owners. I, I mean, I don't know. Well, the whole it's, it's, it's like it's, so upside down. It is, and and it's but it's it's a fear thing because he recognizes just like what we said at the uh, at the beginning of this mm-hmm. is that these guys have a lot of power. Yeah. Um, and you can't just force them to go to work. Like if they decide that they want to park their trucks all in mass, mm-hmm. there ain't much you can do about it. And yeah. and it they can shut this country down. Yeah. Or that country, any country. Yeah. Like, I mean, if they they choose to do it, it's done. Like, mm-hmm. um, so and this seem this they seem to be united enough to to do it. Yeah, and if they're getting the, a lot of support from the population. Yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, I mean, they got my support. I'll tell you that right now. Oh yeah. Um, it it disappoints me that this is happening in Canada and not in the United States, but yeah. it, that may change. Yeah. Um, and I, I have seen. Plenty of people, plenty of those truckers in interviews, like you were saying earlier, being very clear about that they, even that they were vaccinated and boosted, but they are opposed to government mandates, you know, um, they're at least, you know, at least some of them, while they may not, uh, phrase it as such, have an understanding and a belief in bodily autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. That you own yourself. Absolutely. And, um... So I, I'm, need more I'm really happy to see that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm really happy to see that. Um, I mean, we, we've got a few more minutes if you want to talk. Like, so I was talking to a friend of mine, and I do want to mention this because this kind of goes back to that same like pipeline issue about you know protecting the revenues of government using its power to protect the revenues of U.S. corporations. Yeah. Right. Um, and. Uh, so I was talking to a friend of mine whose father um, went into the hospital after a fall, and he through a routine COVID test he came up positive, yeah. and um, and and she was telling me that uh, that she was like, oh, you know, he's okay. They've got him. Um, you know, they're keeping an eye on him, and they put him on remdesivir. And I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, like he may not be all right then. And yeah. so, and she she didn't know anything about it. She was like, I know all I know is that it's COVID medication. And I said, well, actually, it was developed as an Ebola medication, yeah. um, and they discontinued use of it for Ebola because of the bad outcomes. Yeah. Like, just how th- think about how bad the outcomes have to be for you to say, you know, what? we don't want to use this to treat Ebola. Yeah, like, oh yeah, all right. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> And so they've been seeking out some other use for it ever since because they produced... There's know, a they, ton of it. Yeah, yeah, they produced a bunch of it. And this became an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and, of course, Fauci was pushing it at the beginning. Yeah. And from what, I, what I've what i seen is that it is still... Like, it is a toxic drug. It is still dangerous. Yeah. Um, and that it has been... Uh, that there has been, like, a 3% higher mortality in COVID patients if they've taken remdesivir and that... Um, that very few people that get more than two doses of remdesivir even survive. And, um, you know, uh, oh, and it's associated with a 20% higher renal failure. Oh, wow. Um, so it like messes up your kidneys bad. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I told her, I was like, look, I, I mean, I, I think that you should read up on this yourself and, and come to your own conclusions, but, I mean, I told her what I knew about it, but yeah, I was like, yeah. you know, I, I think you should read up on this in your, uh, yourself and come to your own conclusions, but I wouldn't want anybody in my family on remdesivir. And yeah. the more I was thinking about it, um, the more I was thinking, like, I can't even believe, and I've talked to some people who have, you know, paid attention to a lot of this stuff um, throughout the whole COVID thing yeah. um, that have said, I can't believe they're still using that in this country. Yeah. And, and which is exactly what I said to her, actually. Well, yeah. I was like, I can't believe they still... Prescribe I, it. I, well, I thought they had quit prescribing it. So yeah, I mean, the the WHO withdrew their endorsement of it as a COVID medication like six months in or something because of the bad outcomes again. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked to another doctor about it, and I said, well, you know, what are your feelings about remdesivir? Um, and he said, you mean as a COVID treatment? I said, yeah. He said, it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I... I agree, but uh, (laughs) you know, this is like, it's, it's actually dangerous. Right. And I'm not, you know, anyway. Um, and, uh, and of course his thing was, um, you know, I've used ivermectin some, he said the, the best results that I've gotten is just with steroids, but like ivermectin, you have to give it at the right time. Yeah. It's like, you know, you can't give them too soon. You can't give them too late. Like there's a, there's an appropriate time 
to important. give um, steroids, but given at the right time, had really good outcomes. Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, we got to talking about uh, like ivermectin and, and I, I'm going to come back to remdesivir, I promise. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the whole question, I mean, what people should question about it is that ivermectin is a well-known drug. It's been used for a long time. It has very yeah. few side effects um, when dosed properly. Yeah. Uh, if you're getting it prescribed by a doctor, you're going to get it dosed properly. Yeah. Um, and the question is, if COVID was what they claimed it was uh, yeah. at the beginning of this, yeah. um, and it was you know the most dangerous, like... The, the biggest threat to humanity since uh, World War II or whatever, until January 6th at least, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and all this, then why on earth would you preclude use of any treatment that might be yeah. effective, especially one that was inexpensive well, and had a low side effects? Yeah, um, because that's not the name of the game. Big Pharma is it, man. Right. And so the the difference here is that remdesivir is like thirty two hundred dollars a dose, and um and ivermectin is like three dollars a dose, and uh, hydroxychloroquine and zinc are like thirty cents a dose. Yeah. Um, and that's you know that's the problem that you run into. And I, and the more I thought about it after talking to my friend, I thought they're still using it. Well, part of it is just the danger of having a centralized control of a medical system. Yeah. Like if you have dictates about how to th treatment protocols coming down from the CDC or the WHO or the NA NIH or whatever, yeah. um, then like this is one of the dangers that you have yeah. uh, is that you've got a bunch of bureaucrats making these decisions instead of doctors. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're taking away the power of the doctor and the, the, the doctor patient relationship. And, and you're taking away the ability to actually establish best practices yeah. um, because be best practices are established through a bunch of experimentation by individual doctors with their patients yeah. and individual doctors with their patients really care about whether their patients do well or not. Yeah. Um, but these bureaucrats at the top, they don't. Yeah. Oh, and they, in fact, they, Fauci's never seen a patient. Yeah. They, well, and it, they show it through their actions. Like yeah. you can tell that by the, the actions they're taking, they don't have everybody's best interest at heart. And, yeah. And then, you know, and you come back around to the whole science thing and anybody that says the science is settled or you can't question the science or something like that, it just, like turn them off right then. Yeah. Because science is a methodology of asking questions. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> there, there is yeah. no settled science Yeah, there, you know, Anyway, you, you don't get concrete answers. You just quit having answers to the question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what you do is you, you establish the wrong answers. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're left with is the best answer that you have so far. Yeah. Like exactly. that, that's but really you how never start. Goes. You never stop questioning. It. Right. Yeah. Questioning is the, is the vehicle through which science progresses yeah. such that it can be discussed in that manner. Yeah. Um, and, so I, I started thinking more and more like the reason they're still prescribing remdesivir is because they're trying to get rid of inventory. Yeah. That's your pharmaceutical companies. They've, they've produced all of this stuff and they got to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, what's more, what's just as terrifying to me is just the whole, I, I know your, you had said your friend's um, dad was in a hospital, mm -hmm. like just having to me. And I, I, I have a fear of hospitals anyway, yeah. but just having the doctor in the hospital over my care is scary to me. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing that has changed a lot um, is that the uh, it, it used to be that all these private practice doctors had privileges at the various hospitals. Go in and, and check. Yeah. And they were still your doctor. Yeah. Um, or you, you might get a specialist or something in the hospital, but, uh, yeah. but your doctor was still your doctor exactly. um, and making decisions for you in some ways. Yeah. Um, at, at least in the loop. Yeah. Right. And so now they've cut your doctor out of the loop in most cases, um, yeah. especially if your doctor's independent, if your doctor is not a part of that, whatever big system has taken over the medical, uh, medical care in your area. Yeah. Um, then your doctor has almost no say in your care once you go into the hospital yep. and the hospital doctors have become hospitalists and they're less doctors and more administrators. They yeah. have a medical degree, but they're really an administrator well, and their job is to make money for the hospital, yep. not to take care of you, which is where that fear for 
for me comes from because, I mean, I dealt with this with my father when he was in the hospital, dealing mm. with the hospital, because that's the title, like right? that's yeah. what they call them. Yeah. And, oh, and before I get a bunch of emails about this, I'm not saying there aren't good ones out there. Oh, I'm sure there are. <laughs> like, and, and, and I would agree. I'm sure mm. there are plenty of them that care about their patients and, mm. and do the best they can. Yeah. But, and that's kind of my point too, is even if they're doing the best they can, I just feel like they're handcuffed in many ways yeah. just by the job itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's plenty of them that I, we, I've dealt firsthand with plenty of them that I didn't think had the best interest at heart. Yeah. I agree. Um, the, whose real goal was to yeah. free up a bed so that they can charge somebody else another, um, admit fee and yep. yeah, just m- maximize yeah. money in maximize for, for revenue the, for the hospital. Yeah. 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 So, I, that's that's where my fear comes from, and it, it it does it is sad because it hasn't always been that way, and it shouldn't be that way now. Yeah. Um. There there are better ways to do this. Yeah. And at the root of the problem is government control of the medical system, or increasing government control over the medical system. Yeah. I mean, um, this really started with Medicare back in the day. Yeah. Once once the federal government got involved in medical care. It's uh, control over Medicare or medical care has just expanded over the years. Um, it has driven prices up. It has driven quality of care down. Yep. Uh, the root cause is government interference. Yeah. yeah. Get them out, man. <laughs> like that's, that's the solution. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's, a, it's almost a shame we started talking about this so late. I like, I wrote a long editorial in like 1999 about this yeah. when I was working in the medical field. Yeah. Um, because we had so many problems with Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. And, uh, and I wrote a, a long editorial about, um, you know, the division of care and the way they paid and how, um, and the problems with it. Cause at the time, uh, this is of course, you know, Clinton era. Yeah. And so they, they had been pushing Hillary specifically had been pushing for this, like, you know, universal healthcare, single payer system stuff, yeah. um, at, from the federal government. And, uh, and so the article was really about why that was so dangerous. What, what would, yeah. yeah what that would look like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, I would love to get into that on a podcast sometime in the future and really like dig into the details of why it pushes prices up and quality down. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds and it like does it at so many levels too, like including the competency of your doctor. Yeah. Because if you make it hard to make money in the medical field, yeah. Um, then why do the best and the brightest aren't going to go there? Yeah. Yeah. Why, <laughs> why go to medical school? You'd rather go to law school so that you can argue about medical cases. You make more money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I, I don't have anything else. Is there anything you want to add? No, I'm good, man. All right. Um, well, I suppose that that's it for this week then. And, uh, we will, we'll plan to be back here next Thursday. Next Thursday is the 10th. Yeah. All right. Okay. So then in, so we got a couple of weeks before convention. At the, yeah. At the end of this month, we have the um, Alabama Libertarian Party convention in Dothan. So we'll be out of town, but we should get a podcast out before then, or we'll yeah. get a uh, podcast out while we're up there. Dude, I was going to say, yeah, um, we should definitely take the equipment up there. If we, even if we can't get an interview, just do a podcast. Yeah. Uh, Boots on the ground. I mean, if we, if we want to get an interview, I can think of plenty of people that we could get an interview and in short notice with up yeah. there. That would be really Dude, interesting. We, yeah. They're, um, depending on who all is up there, we could have some fun conversations. Yeah. So. Um, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get something interesting out around there. Maybe we can actually pull off the road trip podcast this time <laughs> that we have not succeeded in doing yet. Yeah. Um, I, we talk about this every year, uh, LPA convention time and it just like the sound never works out, but yeah. you know, maybe we're, you no, know, my car is not a quieter car and we're taking my car, right? Well, so, mm. maybe. Um, so the reason I was late getting here today is I'm working on tires for my car. So oh, okay. yeah, I went today and lined up getting tires. Well, down. your car is probably more reliable if you have new tires Yeah, and it's going to have new tires. So yeah, yeah. My, my car's got almost 300,000 miles on it. So yeah, I, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> The tires were my concern, and that's I, I, so I, I wasn't. I'll be honest. The past week, I've been uncomfortable driving my car with the tire situation. So, good. I'm just going to go and bite the bullet and do it. Yeah. All right. Well, and our listeners probably don't care about our car issues. So, well, yeah, <laughs> we, we can talk about this off off mic. Um, anyway, uh, so we'll plan to be back here next Thursday. Um, and in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. 
Subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, and or YouTube. Uh, like and share. Tell your friends. Uh, leave comments. You can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com. Um, and you can visit our webpage at uh, thelibertymike.com. Um, is that it? I think that's it. All right. We got to do something about it. We're, I, I keep being impressed about getting involved with more social media. I'm not going to do it, but maybe <laughs> maybe Liberty Larry will. Yeah. Or maybe we can outsource to one of his kids that's on that stuff all the time anyway. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Yeah. It, it, I, I'm sure that it would benefit us in, in some ways and benefit our listeners as well. Absolutely. Um, so I guess there, it, may, it may be unavoidable in the future. I may have to get involved in some stupid <laughs> social media stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, we'll be here. Um, we'll, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.